Welcome back for another week. You've survived the first week. Good job, everybody. So this week, um, you'll find uh, these, let's see, we'll be going over chapter 15 and chapter 16. So we're gonna be going over the cardiovascular system, talking about the heart, talking about arteries, talking about veins, talking about capillaries and gas exchange. And then in chapter 16, just to give you a little bit of a preview, we're gonna be talking about, um, the lymphatic system. So we're going to be talking about the immune system and how that works because the immune system pretty much likes to operate out of your lymphatic system and how the lymphatic system takes all the rest of the fluids in your body, the interstitial fluids, and pretty much rounds them up and dumps them back in the cardiovascular system. Because liquids are always going every which way in your body and we try to control it as much as possible, but you know, nobody's perfect. So, right Monty? Yes. I have no idea what you were show, talking so about. He's, he's, bit, he's been kind of chilling lately. So anyway, with that said, oh yeah, remember your first exam opens this week. And you've pretty much got from now, which is Wednesday, hopefully you're watching it this Wednesday, the uh, 24th. If not, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know your schedules. Um, but that will close Tuesday at midnight. And remember, I gave you last week that drop-down list of all those words. Those are all words from the, uh, uh, excuse me, from the um, literally each question. So if you, I mean, those, those words are tailored, are literally from every single question in the test. So just to give you a heads up, because study that and you should be good to go. Um, if not, let me know. And I also hopefully will be starting in on replying to a lot of the things going on in the forums. I've been reading it, I've been seeing it. Um, I've just been kind of busy here then and everywhere. And I should be jumping in hopefully, I'm recording today, uh, Tuesday. So hopefully I'll be record, uh, getting in this afternoon to check those things out. With that said, let's jump on in, shall we? All right, so. The cardiovascular system. All right, so the heart is really just one big pump. And actually in humans, it's two pumps working in tandem in a bag. Because the last thing we want is for our two pumps to, well, leave. So we actually kind of lock it down in a bag and we'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, it's interesting where hearts come from. I mean, if you look at the, uh, and I kind of put this right here to kind of show you how hearts have changed and uh, over the, uh, over the, the, the many, many millennia of life on earth, actually more than that, uh, millennia. That is not a word, mom. Lots of, lots of time. Anyway, so. First thing we had, and you can see this in some insects, is literally just uh, the tunicate. It's just literally a single layer of contracting mesoderm that just goes blub, 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 just to push it around. And then we went up and actually tried to make something a little bit more complicated. And then in fish, we finally got our act together and started putting together a two-chambered heart. So we actually had two dedicated areas to start pumping blood through the body. And then we took our wacky thing and we decided to, why not check out a three-chambered heart? And that's where amphibians, some fish, amphibians, and um, reptiles come, what, come into this. So, Monty, he has a three-chambered heart. However, not everybody's heart is quite the same with those three chambers, and a three-chambered heart is not terribly efficient. It works for Monty's needs, doesn't it, Monty? I guess. Yeah, not that he's noticed, because he's still alive, and we're all good, so I guess it's working for him. Uh, but then it was around the time of basically when the birds, the birds are like, hey, let's start working with a four-chambered heart and a closed circulatory system. And the mammals really perfected it in the end, going to a four-chambered uh, four heart. Because keep in mind, you go, oh, wait, we didn't come from birds. And I'm not saying that. We didn't come from birds. We're not even remotely, no. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because what happened is that four-chambered heart uh, evolved independent of each other, which is why birds' four-chambered heart is actually not very good. Um, birds actually are known for just having uh, their hearts misfiring and they've had random heart attacks and just dropped dead out of the sky. Um, yay. 
Can you imagine flying around, minding your own business, actually having a very healthy uh, circulatory system, but suddenly your uh, heart misfires and you go, <laughs> and fall out of the sky. Yeah, not cool. Anyway, so keep in mind the, the four-chambered heart evolved in two different directions um, out of the three-chambered heart, and they just happened to go in that route, but the bird's version was not so hot, and the mammal version actually works insanely well. So there you go. Basically, we went from just a tube of, of a uh, single layer of contracting mesoderm going blub, blub, blub into a two-chambered, then a three-chambered in amphibians, some fish, amphibians, and reptiles like Monty here. And then we went and split out from that with the mammal four-chambered heart and the bird four-chambered heart, which, you know, again, they're both got four chambers, but one works well and the other one is, it's okay. It works, it works well enough for birds, I guess, but, it, you know, not counting the random heart attacks. So anyway, so we split up um, our circulatory system into two parts. You got your pulmonary circuit and your systemic uh, circuit. Your pulmonary circuit is basically sending oxygen poor blood to the lungs to dump all the uh, carbon dioxide it's picked up and, uh, and to pick up fresh oxygen from us breathing in. Then the systemic circuit is basically what gets sent uh, to, uh, from the lungs to be pumped back out again to the rest of the body to, uh, you know, feed everybody. So systemic circuit is, uh, you know, going to the, going to the body and feeding pretty much everybody all over this place. Because remember, you know, what do you need to make, uh, ATP to keep all your cells alive? And that is oxygen along with glucose, which is why we eat and breathe literally. Yes. We just eat and breathe to feed our cells. Really? We're just a, con a bunch of cells working together so that way we can eat and breathe. Anyway, so pulmonary circuit. Again, pulmonary kind of gives it away, going to the lungs. St systemic, going to all the systems. That's kind of how I look at it. Because, you know, if you're, you're looking up your pulse, your pulmonary system. So oxygen poor blood going to the lungs and then oxygen rich blood going to the body. It's kind of like a funky uh, uh, figure eight, funky, funky figure eight with the heart in the middle directing it all, which is actually insanely, insanely clever how it's, how it does this. So we have a bag surrounding our heart, as I mentioned earlier, called the pericardium because A, we want to make sure that our heart A is anchored into our body because it has a lot of force when it's beating blood, especially like, for instance, when you're doing something like exercise or you feel your heart increase, you know, being chased by zombies or something. Why do I keep bringing up zombies? Because I guess it's the easiest go-to because there's no dinosaurs right now to chase you around and kill you, so no zombies either, unless you're a slug. Anyway, now, now the pericardium is a double layered sac and we've got, uh, for, you know, got a double bag it, man. And the outer are, protects and anchors the heart and the inner actually is attached to the muscle wall. Now we have a, again, a pericardial fluid in between that actually makes these two uh, layers suck together and act as one. So not only is it you know, double bagged for our protection and uh, its protection, but that double layer it has the fluid in between to keep those two layers working perfectly together without any friction. Because the last thing you need is friction where your heart beats, because I couldn't even imagine. Oh God, that, but, ooh, that sounds painful. So that's what the pericardium is, double layered uh, with a, a pericardial uh, cavity filled with pericardial uh, fluid to keep those two layers together, acting as one, protecting the heart, keeping it in place, and make sure it's not like, you know, hitting anything and rubbing on anything in your body because we do not need friction while the heart beats. Not cool. 
So again, if you look at it closer, we've got the pericardium and the myocardium. The myocardium would be the muscles. We'll talk about the myocardium in a minute. So anyway, you see the fibrous pericardium. We've got the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. We've got that pericardial cavity flu uh, filled with all the fluid. And then we got the epicardium, the visceral layer right here. It's attached to the myocardium. And then inside, we have a layer called the endocardium and the heart chamber where all the blood's moving around. So that's called the heart wall is the epicardium, the pericard, uh, the myocardium and the endocardium. So we'll talk about all this right here in just a second, because all those muscles are very important and they're actually really neat. I also love looking at the uh, inside of heart. It's just, I find it beautiful. It looks like a whole bunch of trees, uh, roots grown together. Um, if you know, this class wasn't completely online, I definitely invite you to come to my lab and I'd hand you um, a sheep heart. I have several to show, to let you a explore it and check it out and also to open it up and check out the inside of the heart chambers and how uh, the uh, everything's grown. I just think it's the prettiest thing. There's a couple of things I find in the body that just are just so cool looking and that's, this is definitely one of them I just really enjoy how nature grows things sometimes. I also will get this weird about um, parts of the uh, kidneys too. Anyway, so, <laughs> anyway, so again, the heart needs blood. It's doing a ton of pumping to get the rest of the blood around. So he's one of the first ones that's fed off the lungs, uh, which is extremely important. So he needs his cut because if anything goes wrong and the blood and the heart doesn't get blood, well, that's pretty much leading up to a, a heart attack and be and or deaf. Uh, so this guy, you know, uh, gets blood pretty much right up straight. And then he also, so he has uh, major arteries. And if any of these gets blocked, that's no bueno. And then we've got uh, veins taking all the used away. So notice the heart is conveniently located in between the lungs. Yeah, that's her a reason. So these guys get fresh blood pretty much right up instantly and get theirs carted away right up instantly because this guy is responsible for getting it around to everybody else. So he needs his cut up front and center. Now, the heart actually does have a skeleton. If you cut it right here, and I'm sorry, the picture is eating into the words. You know, I should just fix that since we're here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Fixed. I don't know why it's like that. There we go. Is it middle? There we go. Back to slideshow. There we go. Fixed it. So these are really interesting. So it's dense connective tissue surround the origins of the pulmonary trunk and aorta. In other words, it's to give some uh you know, so, hold on, using my word. Basically to give some structure and strength to the two major valves. Also these other valves down here that are also extremely important. So the tricuspid valve or the mitral or bicuspid valve. So that way these guys aren't being blown open in any way, being flippy floppy. So we actually do have connective tissue that makes the skeleton of the heart. Now it isn't bone, it's just dense connective tissue. So again, it gives uh, attachments to the heart valves so they're not flopping around because that can be insanely dangerous if you've got, you know, your valves flopping about, uh, which is usually known as a, uh... boy, Monty, come with me on this. You know, flutter of the heart. Now there's a technical term for it. Watch, it will come to me in the next chapter lecture just to drive me insane. Anyway. Um, so prevents excess dilation during contraction, so that way we're not ripping anything. And these rings, along with other fibrous masses, uh, make up the skeleton of the heart. So it's kind of cool. So the heart does have support. So how does the heart work? Well, so what happens is blood that is coming in from uh, the systemic circuit that is needs to go to the lungs, that is coming in and it's oxygen uh, poor, it has a bunch of carbon dioxide, needs to get out. We need to breathe out to the lungs. So it comes in, comes on down into the uh, loading area, into the right ventricle. And then 
there's a reason why the heart actually points downwards is because we're actually using uh, gravity to assist us to drain the right atrium into the right ventricle. And then you'll notice here where all the muscle is in the heart. It's around the right and left ventricles. So what's going on is then again, the muscle squeezes and it has the most squeeze down at the bottom. So these guys drain out of the right and left atrium into the right and left ventricle squeeze. And that powerful squeeze shoots the blood towards the lungs and shoots the uh, oxygenated lung back into the systemic system to go around the body and feed all our cells. So it's just, I find it's just insanely and fascinating. So you'll notice again, and this might be a test question, um, how thin the muscles are in the right and left. Why? Because, and why is the heart pointing somewhat down, even though the side, hi Monty, sorry about that. Um, that's because we don't need as much muscle out here. We're just kind of using gravity and a little bit of a squeeze to drain everything down into the right and left ventricles for the main pump that will shoot, have enough force to shoot the blood around the body or the blood into the lungs to uh, do the gas exchange. So I just, uh, and it's, that's what these valves do is they actually uh, make sure that there's no backwash because we do not need blood going back up into the atriums when we're trying to shoot it out, like for instance, from the left ventricle into the aorta and go wah, you know, back out into the body. Except it doesn't make wah, it's lub dub. Anyway, we'll get to that noise in a moment. So just notice where the most of the muscle is in the heart. Also, another thing when talking with the heart is, you know, animations like this are worth their weight in gold. It just, it helps a lot, especially for me. I'm, I'm kind of a visual kinesthetic learner myself and having, showing this actually is insanely important. And you'll notice these things right here. These, these are really fun, especially if I, you know, if we could do a, you know, a live dissection. These are really cool because these anchor the different parts of the uh, valves. So that way, again, we don't get blowback. And um, because we want these valves to shut completely and not blow out the other opposite way or fall apart and go the other way. So we actually have these heart strings to keep them in place, which is very nice. So the heart works under pressure where the blood gets pumped from low pressure, the atria into high pressure ventricles. Basically what I was saying about being more muscular here and less muscular, uh, and less muscular here because not only it's gravity, but it's also pressure. Low pressure to high pressure. And that's again why we want these valves to shut because we don't want it to accidentally with all that pressure, shoot it back into the atrium. No, no, no. So low pressure atria into the high pressure ventricles. The pressure changes uh, open and close the valves. And that's where you get that lub dub, lub dub noise. So systole is the contraction of the heart chambers and that gives you the lub noise. Distally is the relaxation of the heart chambers which gives you that dub noise. And basically, you know, these things are, are happening simultaneously. You know, they fill up the atria with the uh, deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood and then they dump into the ventricles and then again push and then push that, you know, to the body and again at the same time pushing all the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. It's, it's just amazing how efficient it is. It really is. The heart is just an amazing organ. And it's, it's fascinating how we've, uh, we've finally come to make artificial hearts and things like that. Because, and you know, putting in, you know, heart valves and pacemakers and whatnot, because we've always had such a fascination with hearts in the human body. Now, the cardiac cycle. So during a cardiac cycle, the pressure in the heart chamber uh, chambers rise and fall. So the pressure changes open and close those valves, the tricuspid and the, uh, and the uh, mitral valve. So during atrial systole and ventricular distally, the ventricular uh, ventricles are relaxed. The AV, we'll talk about the AV node in a minute. He's basically the pacemaker of the heart. He, the AV and the uh, SB pretty much sit there and run the electricity over the heart over and over again to make it pump in unison, which is actually quite impressive itself. So the AV valves open 
and the semilunar valves close. And about 70% of the blood uh, flows passively from the atria into the ventricles. The atrial systole pushes the remaining 30% into the ventricles, causing pressure in the ventricles to increase, to give it more power, if you will, to, you know, when it squeezes to shoot the, uh, the blood out in where it's supposed to go, either the you know, pulmonary circuit or the systolic circuit. So during ventricular systole and atrial distole, the AV valves close. The chordae tendae prevent the cusps of the valves from bulging too far backwards. That's what those heart strings were, the chordae tendrae on these guys right here. Because we don't want bulge. We don't want your heart bulging. And um, uh, blood flows into the atria from the vena cavae and the pulmonary veins. The ventricular pressure increases, opens the semilunar valves. Blood flows into the pulmonary trunk and aorta, and again, round and round we go. So that is the cardiac cycle. Now, the cardiac muscle cells form branching networks, and they have, and this is why, you know, when we went over last semester, um, all the different three types of muscle cells. So you've got your skeletal muscles, which you should have already covered in the last semester, your uh, heart muscles, and your... Um, smooth muscles, which we're going to talk about again when we hit the digestive system a little later down the road, because that's when they come back into play. But these guys have those, those discs. They, they have the striations, but they also have discs between these branching networks. And those intercalculated discs contain gap junctions. So if you remember what the gap junctions were, they're like little holes in between each of the cells. Uh, so that way things can flow faster through it. So action potentials can be spread through a network of cells. So imagine it, you know, like electricity going down and has all these open channels so that way it can go through, it can flow, through, uh, flow faster. And because of this, they can act as a unit. And there's no pause, no wait, no nothing. It's like when, you know, the, uh, AV needed says jump, the whole heart jumps. So cardiac muscles form a functional synctium, which is a mass of merging cells that function as a unit. So these guys are extremely in tune with each other because of these branching networks, because of these intercalculated discs with those gap junctions that allow everything to work without interference of you know the cells, you know having the cell uh, membranes get in the way of anything. So. Two such masses exist in the heart. We've, in the arterial walls, we have the atrial synchronum, and in the ventricular, uh, ventricular walls, we have the ventricular synchronum. So, how does this work? Well, you got the SA node, like I said, who's the pacemaker of the heart. So the cardiac uh, conduction system, so groups of clumps of strands of specialized cardiac muscle tissue, which initiates and distributes the impulses through the myocardium, coordinates the events of the cardiac cycle. So it's actually kind of neat. So you get your SA node right here. He's sitting on top of the right atrium. Remember, this is kind of more, it shows inside, but it's actually more like on top of. Uh, but we do the cutaway to kind of show you what's going on here. And again, here's the little heart strings. So anyway, the SA node basically sends a signal and it jumps over all of this muscle right here to hit the AV node. And then the AV node then spreads down these um, uh, junctional fibers, splits into these, uh, wait, no, junctional fibers are back here. AV node goes down to the AV bundle, which is right here, the bundle branches, and then you've got the Perzinki fibers, which are these like little like root looking things coming off. And that's the ventricular synchronum, which makes this guy go. So this jumps, which makes these two squeeze. Then it hits the AV node to slow it down a tad, because what we need, even though that jump is perfect, and it makes both the uh, right and left atrium squeeze, we need a bit of a pause. So that way we don't have squeeze, squeeze, because that would be too fast. We've got to wait for these guys to fill and the valves to close completely before we do the squeeze. So this jump, setting these guys off, then it hits AV node and then it hits that you know AV bundle, slows it down just enough to give enough time for the valves to close and the right ventricle to go, okay, now I squeeze. 
So there, that's why there's this jump right here. If you're wondering, well, why is it got the jump? Because we, and then it hits all these, you know, bundle branches and then the Pujinki fibers right here to uh, excite the uh, ventriculars to uh, squeeze and pump. Well, that's because we need to slow it down for the timing, just a hair. So that's why we have the SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart, do, the quick, uh, do a quick jump to the AV node to set these guys off, but then it slows down just a hair and has to travel down these roots to tell this guy to go ahead and wait to fill up and squeeze. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's why there's a, there's a time pause between this. Now, so major components. So the SI or syn sinoatrial node pacemaker initiates rhythmic contractions of the heart, internodal uh, atrial muscle conducts impulses from the SA node to the atria. Junctional fibers, this conducts impulses from the SA node to the AV node. That's what uh, basically what it's jumping over right here. It's, it's jumping over those junctional fibers that are located in these muscle cells in these. Now, the uh, AV or atrioventricular node basically conducts impulses to the AV bundle, delays the impulse, like I was saying, so that way that the atria can finish contracting before the ventricles go. So we need just a bit of a pause so that way the atria can finish emptying and the valves close before. <laughs> anyway, the AV uh, atrioventricle bundle of his uh, conducts impulses rapidly between the AV node and the bundle branches. And then the left and right bundle branches split off from the AV node, conduct impulses to the Perjinki fibers on both sides of the heart. The Perjinki fibers are large fibers that conduct impulses to the ventricle myocardium so it knows to squeeze up. That brings us to, since, you know, we actually do have a bit of electricity running around and jump-starting our heart all the time, or just making our heart run in the first place, which is why we can use defibrillators to jump-start the heart. You know, a shock of electricity actually does the job, hopefully. Anyway, we get this. We actually can hook people up, and we get a uh, recording of the electrical charges, and that gives us the electrocardiogram, or the ECG, or the EKG, depending on who's saying what, where. Um, I've heard it called both. So anyway, so this uses the heart's ability to conduct impulses, and so the deflections in the normal ECG waves include the P wave, which is the arterial depolarization, which just occurs prior to the atrial contraction. Um, and the QRS complex, which are three waves of ventricular depolarization, occurs just prior to the ventricular contraction. And then the T wave, which is a ventricular repolarization. So while the muscle cells getting reset, going back uh, just prior to the reticular re uh, ventricular relax relaxation. All of the big words. So a record of this, now you may be going, wait, we see the depolarization and the repolarization of the ventricles. What about, and we see in the P wave, the atrial depolarization, but where's the repolarization of the atria? Does it not just do it? It's actually hidden in the QRS complex. Because these guys, the depolarization is so big and there's a series of three waves, that one gets hidden. <coughs> Test question. Anyway, so. So be careful of the atrial repolarization. It's kind of hidden in the QRS wave. Also, P wave and T wave are also on the test. Not a picture, just, you know, questions about them. Know your waves. So anyway, to calculate your heart rate, basically you count the number of R waves in six seconds, six large blocks, and then it gives you a one minute per rate. Some of you probably know this better than I do because um, you're either nurses or you're going or you're EMTs or something, something, something cheese. You probably know all this a lot better than I do. So anyway, so P wave, so atrial depolarization, and then basically what happens is you get the QRS complex, so Q, R, S, and this is the ST right here. And then the T is the depolarization, so he's ready to go again. So again, P wave, arterial depolarization. The delay at the AV node is literally right here. So that bump from the P to the first 
part that dumps down in the QRS complex, that's that deep, that's that weight, that pause that we saw back here. So SA node jumping over the AV node. So that, or that pause when it hits right here, the AV bundle. So it pauses that you can literally see the pause right there. Then the ventricular depolarization, you get the big push. And then the ventricular uh, repolarization. And this right here, like I said, is pretty much where you get a hidden of the, H, uh, the arterial repolarization as well, right in here. It gets kind of hidden by the QRS complex. And, uh, and then again, goes through for a little bit of a pause before it goes again. So there you go. We also split this up into the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT interval as well. So hopefully this kind of breaks it down. Like I said, some of you probably know this better than I do, which is totally fine. <laughs> um, so hopefully that breaks it down a bit. Anyway, so the SA node normally controls the heart rate. Sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers modify the heart rate in response to changing conditions like physical exercise. So, you know, if I'm exercising body temperature, um, if you get hotter, your heart rate increases. Fight or flight. So, for instance, you know, zombies. Zombies, zombies, zombies. And you got to run away from the zombies. Uh, concentration of various ions, and so, such as um, you know potassium and calcium. Uh, parasympathetic impulses versus the vagus nerves decrease the heart rate due to influence on the SA and AV nodes. So when we come back from fight or flight, we have to calm back down because there are no such thing as zombies. Or like yesterday, I actually had to go to Lowe's to buy a part for my fridge and somebody came up behind me and goes, uh, it was so weird. They were like, is your hair real? Yeah, I, I have really long hair, but I mean, and before I could say anything, he grabs it and tugs it. And I'm like, so yeah, that made my sympathetic impulse kind of uh, increase my heart rate. <laughs> then the parasympathetic afterwards was like, calm down, try not to, you know, it was weird. So anyway, so baroreceptor reflexes arise from cardiac control center and the mundula oblongata balance inhibitory and excretory effects of the parasympathetic and the sy sympathetic because you don't need the two systems going at you at the same time. It's kind of like, you know, drinking coffee with a lot of caffeine in it and then drinking alcohol because you know caffeine's an upper and alcohol's a downer on your system and you don't need the two of them going at war and you and your heart going i i'm, I'm so confused because the last thing you need is irregular impulses so the cardiac control center regulates these autonomic impulses to the heart so we don't get irregular heartbeats now, there are people who have to deal with irregular heartbeats. I had a student uh, years ago actually came in. She actually had uh, an arrhythmia, but it wasn't like crazy, but they still kept an eye on it. And it was interesting because we had an EKG machine in here and we actually hooked her up to watch uh, it happen. It was interesting to compare hers to the rest of us. So fun. Uh, I hope you don't have <laughs> one of those, but still, there's some people that, you know, their heart's a little bit irregular, which is, interesting and they have to be very careful all right so again um animations i believe are like glorious especially for figuring out how the heart works um he does a really good job with his animations hank here in crash course good stuff good stuff another one that is kind of interesting and goes a little bit into the history it's short but interesting um it doesn't get into the same level of details as Crash Course does because it's shorter. And that's the Ted Ed right here of how the heart actually pumps blood. He goes more into the interesting history. For the longest time, we actually didn't quite know how the heart works. We opened it up, but it's not the same thing as looking at a dead heart and trying to get it to work like a living heart. And um, I even have my students do an experiment when they're in here in the lab with me is when I give them the heart, I, you know, I instruct them to cut certain things, not cut it in half instantly but to try and replicate it with water 
And um, it's hard because it's, it's dead tissue and it doesn't flex like living tissue does, but it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea how it works. But if you're just looking at the thing, you know, before we had too many ideas about that, it's a bit counterintuitive, but really clever on the part of nature. I just, I just find our heart to be such a beautiful organ. So love your heart. And I'm sad I didn't wear my, my, my heart dress. Monty, why didn't you remind me? Oh, well. Maybe next time I'll coordinate better with uh, what I'm teaching. Anyway, so with that said, there you go. Uh, first part of chapter 15, and I'll see you in the next bit. Bye!